you know, this system um, should have ended a long time ago. The way I look at it is, you know, perhaps, you know, the, the Asian crisis in, in 1998, that was probably the last time that this, this whole problem could have been dealt with honestly. Um, you know, the world could have um, basically restructured its debt then um, and had a prolonged recession and then come out clean on the other side. Maybe it could have done that after the dot-com crash in 2001. But by the time you get to 2008, the problem keeps getting bigger and bigger because every time you go through one of these, the response is, OK, let's not have an in let's not have a recession. Let's just basically create more money, create more debt um, so that this particular administration or government doesn't have to look bad. Um, we push the problem on to the next one. And so actually, I, I feel slightly well, no, I don't, I don't feel bad because I, I don't care, but I feel slightly bad for the current UK government because, you know, we, we've got a new prime minister. Um, you know, she comes in, she shakes hands with the Queen, the Queen immediately dies, and then she gets her hands on uh, on the Treasury and the Treasury immediately dies. Um, I'm not really sympathetic because the new government would have done all of the bad things that all of the previous governments have done. Um, but, you know, th these are accumulation uh, accumulation of problems that have built up over time. This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Monero.com Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero safely on iOS and Android too. Monero.com Wallet is open source and you always control your own keys. And by IVPN. Resist online surveillance with IVPN, a privacy-focused audited and transparent VPN provider that accepts Monero directly. Monero.com Wallet and IVPN are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. And supporting us is easier than ever. By typing in MoneroTalk.crypto in your Monero.com or Cake Wallet send address field to send us a tip. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Tuman interviews Dan, who in his recent thread brilliantly dissects the collapsing dollar-based global financial system and lays out the three possible solutions to the biggest debt bubble in all of human history. In this chat, they discuss the implications of the dollar losing its dominance in trade, how this decade will demonstrate that the fiat system is not serving the people's interest, the Great Reset, why CBDCs mean digital slavery, BTC being co-opted by governments, the need for Monero in the post-fiat financial system, and much more. Monero Talk starts now. All right. Dan, good morning, or I guess good afternoon to you. Yeah, morning. Good to see you, sir. How you doing? Uh, I, I like doing these early ones every now and then. It's I, I, I get a different perspective. The, the morning version of me is different than the evening version. Yeah, for for the better, I hope. Yeah. Um. I, in answer to your question, no, I, I'm I'm absolutely dying here. The kids have gone back to school, and the first thing I got is is a cold uh, return from that. So, you know, I hope I hope I won't let the side down. But um, yeah, fire it at me, and I'll, I'll do my best. Well, I guess at least we're at the point when when the kids get the cold, they're not shutting the entire school down anymore, right? I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah, at least we've gotten beyond that point for now. For now, we'll we'll see what happens next. Yeah, I was homeschooling for about two years on on the back of that, but um. I mean, hopefully we've moved on to a fresh set of madness now. Yes, there's always something new. Um, yeah. yeah, so I, I discovered you on Twitter. You put out a, a really good tweet thread basically summarizing where you see all of this going in terms of the financial markets, uh, where we're currently at, where you see it going, you know, and ultimately what you see, what you you distilled it as uh, three three options that that governments have to get us out. Uh, maybe we'll start there first, but before you even get there, maybe you want to give a little bit of a background. I don't know. How do you know so much about this stuff? You seem to very eloquently be able to explain it all. Well, basically what is happening, I've been waiting for it for 20 years. Um, so my background is I actually started as, as a bit of a political apparatchik, um, with one of the political parties in the UK here, uh, going through a leadership election. Um, and actually my guy, he, he never, he never won the leadership of the party. Um, and so then I had to pivot and I had to go into something else. So, so I've maintained interest in politics. But what I then did is I went into venture capital, private equity and asset management, that kind of thing. And so I spent the last 20 years doing that. Now, the skill set that I have is primarily uh, what we call a bottom up perspective on investing, which is going to companies, seeing 
kicking the tires essentially, seeing how they're doing, how they're put together, how they're run. You would think that that is the um, that is the essential basis of any economy: is individual companies doing useful things. However, over the last couple of years, it is it is simply more profitable and easier uh, to try and second guess what 12 elders in a room are going to decide the price of money in the US is going to be, which then basically drives the entire financial system of the rest of the world. You know, we, we have moved a long way away from fundamentals being important to anything. It's basically all about liquidity flows now. Um, and it's increasingly going to be that case, um, you know, as we come into this sort of end of a 40-year debt cycle, effectively, where things are blowing up. And let's let's jump into the thread. I mean, uh, you want to give a quick, you know, summary yeah. of, of how you see how, where we're currently at and what you see our, our choices be or government's choices being in terms of how they respond to things? So the reason I wrote the thread is, is obviously we are seeing issues emerging at the moment. Um, and I was incredibly frustrated that basically all journalists all politicians, all central bankers, um, and about 75% of even financial professionals are ignoring the elephant in the room. The elephant in the room is the size of the debt. Um, I won't need to tell an audience um, on, on, a, on a crypto podcast that in 1971, the US defaulted on its debt. It got rid of gold underpinning the currency. And now the only thing that underpins um, modern financial systems is effectively the promises of politicians. It's all underpinned by debt now. And the nature of this, if you if you want if you go upstream enough, it's people's desire to get something for nothing. So that people choose to elect politicians who will tell them that they can spend more than they can actually afford to do so. The US is uh, a particularly bad example of this. I don't think there's anything um, fundamentally wrong with with America, you know, its, it, it's people or anything like that. It's simply because um, you know they were uh, they were the dominant nation throughout this period that has led them to get these excessive debts. And I thought we can't have a conversation about what's going wrong at the moment until we face up to the fact that this debt is there. In the thread, I, I picked on the US because we live in a um, a dollar based global system, um, and I do say in the thread that. European countries um, and the UK, we, we have these issues as well, but they are most manifest in the US. Um, so let's start our analysis there. And effectively, what I did is, is I basically just laid out the size of the debt. Anyone who wants to do this, um, I'm sure a lot of people will be familiar with this, you can go to usdebtclock.org and you can see the debt there. Um, current US national debt is, is 30 trillion. And that's just the national debt. Um, you can then add in the state and local taxes, as uh, I debt. You can add in the personal debt, and then you can add in the really big one, which is the um, unfunded liabilities. When you put all of that together, it's a, it's a staggering amount of money. So to put this in perspective, I, I talked in the thread about the deficit. So the deficit is, is currently running at over a trillion. And how did I put it? I said, you know, that would be enough money to buy... Um, everybody in several in, in several states, uh, you know, a, a new Lamborghini. I think it was like North Dakota. It was it was Alaska and a couple of others. You, you, you could buy everyone uh, a new Lamborghini with, with just the deficit. But if you look at the debt, which is you know the total amount that has been accumulated, not just the new bit that's going on every year. I worked this out this morning. Let me let me throw up these numbers. So you could buy a new Lamborghini for everybody in the U.S., Canada, Mexico, England, and get two Lamborghinis for everybody in the Ukraine with the amount of money that the US has accumulated in debt. That's what's driving this. Because at the moment, what politicians um, and central bankers are trying to do is they are trying to combine impossible things. So they want to reduce the debt and have low inflation and have low taxes. And they're trying to do it without money printing. You, you, you can't have that. It's, it's not going to work. One of these elements have to give. Right, they they basically have their back up against the wall at this point, and so what you see as being, I think you laid it out in your thread, like the the three options that they have. Yeah, this <clears throat> this for me is the worrying thing because um, when people actually understand what the three options are, they are going to choose the inflation, which is horribly damaging, but it is potentially 
uh, not as bad as, as the others. So let's go for the options. Option number one is you pay down this debt honestly. And what that would essentially mean is that you cut government spending to the bone. Um, you, you, you would be having to trim something like 70% of government spending. Um, I know what that looks like in the UK. Um, it would be, you know, you can probably keep the armed forces, uh, the police, the courts and the roads, but you'd have to lose the NHS, you'd have to lose pensions, you'd have to lose welfare, you'd have to lose uh, foreign aid. That is not going to happen in the UK. Nobody is ever going to vote for that. The NHS over here is basically a religion. You know, uh, doctors and nurses are, tr are treated like high priests over here. Um, so it, I, I know that that option is simply unviable. I would imagine that whatever the US equivalent is, is, is equally unviable. I mean, you would have to, you know, drastically trim your military. You would have to um, get rid of Medicare. I mean, and, and so much more. And then you would have to run that for the next 10 years um, with taxes still high to pay down the debt. And, and it could be longer than 10 years. I haven't done the sums yet. I will do the sums, but it is going to be a long time. OK, so nobody is ever going to vote for option one. You are not going to honestly pay off the debt. Right. Pol politically, it would never happen. Is what you're yeah. Saying. No political party that offered that um, would ever be accepted. You know, you know, politi e e e even the most uh, you know, rookie politician uh, knows enough not to even to attempt to offer something like that to the voters. So honestly, paying down this debt is simply a non-starter. OK, what are your next options? Um, your next option is that you default on the debt and you just say, sorry, no, we're not paying it. Um, sucks to be you, but, you know, we, we, we're just not paying it. Smaller nations have done that in the past. That is not going to be an option for um, developed Western nations, um, such as the UK and such as the US. The reason for that, we talked about this a minute ago, that after 1971, um, fiat currencies are now basically debt-based money. And actually, the way it works is that sovereign debt forms the base layer of the collateral of the financial system. So Western banks will be holding sovereign debt as their core collateral from which they then go on to do their financial activities, from which they lend out money. If you wipe out that base layer, you have basically wiped out money. You will trigger a um, an accelerating um, uh, deflationary collapse of the money supply. So you can't let the collateral level fail. You can't let the sovereign debt fail. Is that is that what we start uh, starting to see in in Britain yeah. with the pound? Uh, yeah, effectively that. So, so that's why I know that. Uh, well, that's why I knew that they would be going back to to money printing. It, it happened that my thread was in, extremely timely because it came out, I think, on the on the Saturday, and we were back to money printing within about four days. <laughs> but I mean, it's, it's perfectly obvious that um, you know that option two is also a non-starter because mm -hmm. you will wipe out the monetary system, and then because money is half of every transaction. Um, that basically shuts down the entire economy. It shuts down all supply chain. There, there is no incentive for the farmer to deliver his food anymore because he's not going to get paid for it. There's no incentive for the wholesaler to pass it on to the shops and so on. The whole thing shuts down. Now, if that were to happen, yes, I expect a new system would emerge. But if it happened in, in a disorderly fashion, you'd be looking at mass starvation you'd be looking at a complete collapse of, of global supply chains, even if a new system was put up relatively quickly, say within, say within 18 months, because in that, in that meantime, um, you know, all, all food exports would stop, all, all fuel exports would, would stop. So, you know, that, that is an absolute disaster case scenario. Nobody wants that. Now, perhaps with the developments in blockchain, um, there are going to be alternatives that are going to be viable in the next few years, but we're probably not at that point. We simply don't have the user adoption at this stage. Is this the, the third? What is what is the third option? What was the, the third? Did we did we skip? The third it? option is basically they do what they what they were doing, what they temporarily stopped doing, uh, and what the Bank of England has now started to redoing, which is you basically just print the problem away. Right. Just continue yeah. on, on the road we're already on, where we just deal with it as as we get, pretend nothing's going on pretend that the debt isn't continuing to go yeah it's going to be it's going to be very obvious there's something going on because i think the only way that these western nations can get out of the hole that they put themselves in is basically to run inflation in the double digits for at least a decade 
Now, what that will do is it will drastically reduce the real size of that debt. But uh, wage earners are going to get crushed. So the way it works is when you generate uh, additional money is uh, financialized assets um, and things with a fixed supply tend to respond quite positively to that. You know, there is only so much land in existence. So if you increase the amount of money, the value of land goes up. There's only so many um, productive businesses. So again, the value of those stocks go up. So it will be a tremendous boon to the already wealthy. But it will be absolutely crushing to people who don't hold assets, who, who work for a living, who earn a, who earn a wage. Because wages respond very slowly to inflation. There's a big lag behind it. People on pensions, people on wages, they're going to get crushed. But it's better than those other two options. Right. And politically, that's just the way it ends up working out, because obviously the wealthy people will, will still be wealthy. It's really the, the middle class and the lower class that are going to get crushed. Uh, so politically, it ends up moving in this direction all the time, because uh, uh, th those that have the money already are also those that are in charge. Yeah, well, the, the, the people who have the, the money, that the, they will get considerably wealthier. Right. And because those, those financialized assets will respond. So, so, so basically stocks will go up. So, I mean, we, we saw this over the, over the sort of lockdown period. At the beginning of the lockdown period, there was a considerable amount of quantitative easing, which is basically putting, I mean, purists will say it's not money printing. Yeah, it basically is. It, 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 it's printing money. Um, yeah, the US created something like, um, you know, 30% of all the dollars that have ever existed were created in that first year of lockdown. Um, other countries, such as the UK, they, they did something very similar. They increased their money supply. And what you saw was a tremendous boom in stocks and other assets. Um, land values went up. They, I think they're going to be forced back into it, as the Bank of England was yesterday. The US is currently managing to avoid that because effectively what's, what it's doing with its strong dollar is it's exporting its inflation. It's pushing the problem onto, onto other countries. Um, and the US kind of likes it for now, um, you know, maybe not the US people, because they can see the damage that it's being um, wrought across the world. Um, but but US policy, the US elite, they, they probably quite like it because it's pushing the problem elsewhere. But it is a really big problem for all these other nations, because when 80 percent of the um, world's um, uh, exchanges with, a, you know, 80 percent of the world trade is, is done in the dollar, and you've got this um, dollar wrecking ball going around, which is creating a problem for you. It's, it's, it's messing with your economies. If you're, you know, if you're Argentina and you want to trade with South Africa and you have to, you have to do it in dollars or the arrangements of dollars. And it is basically a requirement that you have to do it in dollars if you're, if you're doing it in energy. Um, at some point, countries around the world are going to say, I don't want to deal with this anymore. Get me off of the dollar. And that is a real danger the US, because a big part of the US's power comes from the fact that the dollar is so dominant and that everybody wants to use it. The petrodollar is another factor in this that we could come on to talk about. And you could see a situation where around the world, people just say, OK, get me out. I want to use something else. The problem is it is not obvious what that something else is at the moment. Um, gold, potentially, is problematic. Uh, and the logic of gold requires that you do a lot of centralizing in time it could be um something like bitcoin it could be um you know one of the developments in in, in the blockchain that could be um the solution but we just don't have the adoption levels yet and frankly the, the user interface for a lot of this stuff is also quite poor you know it's, it's one thing if you are if you're willing to put the time in and you can understand it but you wouldn't want your mum buying a house um, and, and trying to do it through, uh, you know, through the blockchain. I don't think we're quite there yet, but we could be there in a few years. Um, but another option is this new BRICS currency. So uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, they're looking to put together a new um, reserve currency for the world. Um, you know, maybe a lot of the trade starts going on to that. Isn't, isn't that, that's probably the most likely scenario, right? If not, if not the dollar, it will be another state-owned, issued, run Dollar. Yeah. So we're probably going to move from the from the world of there being a single reserve currency, which is the US dollar and everything is priced in that to having uh, possibly multiple reserve currencies. Um, so I think the dollar is still going to be there. Uh, this new BRICS currency will probably be one of them. You know, the pound might be a uh, minor player in that um, and possibly Bitcoin could join that ranks as well. And, and maybe there will be even some some way for, for gold to slip into it. Well, 
Um, but yeah, I, th I think we're going to have to transition to multiple um, reserve currencies. However, what's that going to do is there are an awful lot of dollars out there. So if the world is forced to move away from the dollar because it's just so strong that it's causing a problem for people, what you could then see is a lot of those dollars flood back to the US. And all the time the US has been exporting its inflation effectively, that could reverse very sharply if a huge amount of dollars suddenly flood back to the US, and that could be a problem. So the so the Federal Reserve is going to have to think about caref very carefully about how much does it want to push this pain out to the rest of the world. Um, we saw it last week with the Bank of Japan. Um, we saw it yesterday with the Bank of England. And we'll probably see it next week with the ECB, uh, because I think that the Italian debt is going to come under attack fairly soon. And if, if the dollar is so strong that it forces people to another alternative, um, then that that hurts the US. And so the Fed might be forced to to backtrack just to stop people from from, from basically doing the nuclear option and, and abandoning the dollar. When you say backtrack, quantitative easing or, or raising interest rates? I mean, low, so lowering I, interest rates. Yeah, so so I, I think that I think that's basically inevitable. Um, I mean, you, you've already you've already seen it here. Um, and, and I think it's going to come as well because you know if if you have thirty trillion in national debt before you take on to account your your unfunded liabilities and and your other debts, so effectively two hundred trillion in debt, it's a vast amount of debt. It is unpayable. So the only way you're going to address it is if you have a a prolonged period of very high inflation. So this idea that um, the Fed can get um, inflation under control by, by by jacking up interest rates, I'm afraid it's a fantasy. Now, why why is it any different than the 70s, right? When Volcker came in and, you know, he, he's now looked at as a hero historically, mm. right? Uh, Powell, you know, potentially is trying to... Uh, follow in you know and do what he did uh but you're saying that that's not possible now even though it was yeah yeah i mean this is the thing everyone at the fed they, they hero worship uh volker they, they they all want um in a few years time to be on the front cover of a book um <laughs> just like he is you know a book that they've all read they're, they're trying to emulate that look the reason he's not going to work is because back in the 70s the debt wasn't held by the government so you can jack up interest rates all you like and you can put, uh, you know, why, why do they care if, if you know, this and that business goes out of, you know, go, goes insolvent, if if this person holding, um, you know, um, hold, holding these assets goes insolvent. The difference now is it's the government that owns the debt. Because after 2008, um, when we had the bank solvency issue, the problem got kicked upstairs. The problem got kicked up to the sovereign level, right? So it's different to the 70s because back then they were willing to uh, make other people go insolvent to solve the problem. They are not going to make themselves insolvent to solve the problem. Now, um, everybody is talking as if the, the Fed can, in isolation, focus on getting these inflation rates down. Actually, the, the Fed has a um, a senior mandate to that, something that ranks above it, and that is to fund the US government at attractive rates. If the US government has to fund its current debt pile at these new higher rates, it will become insolvent. I haven't run the numbers on the US, but I have looked at them for the UK. And if the UK were to roll over um, all of its debt at its current new funding cost, it would cause a significant increase. It's something like a, you know, a, a, well, I think more than quadruples their, their interest payments. And the UK at that point would be spending two and a half times as much on its interest payments as it does on its um, Air Force, Army and Navy combined. Actually, the problem is even worse for the US because the US has higher debt levels, um, not hugely high. If you count the unfunded liabilities, it's significantly higher, but the, the, the straight debt levels is higher. The longer this goes on, the more means more U.S. debt is rolled over at this higher rate. And the U.S. government cannot afford it unless it wants to significantly cut spending, which, as we've discussed, is not possible. So I think the market understands this. And if you look at the forward expectations of where interest rates are going to be, um, everybody understands that those rates are going to have to come down at some future point um, because the Fed cannot let the um, let the US government become insolvent.
the Fed is obligated to buy um, U.S. Um, de uh, uh, debt tranches that do not sell. So actually, the, the government can force the hand of the Fed if it needs to, because it can simply, um, you know, put out these um, debt obligations. And if nobody else comes along to buy them, which is probably not going to be the case if the experience of the ECB, the Bank of Japan and, and, and the Bank of England is, is uh, representative of anything, the Fed is then going to have to step in and start buying those bonds. Now, at that point, you can't be running quantitative easing and quantitative tightening at the same time. You know, this is a mockery. But I think effectively what has to happen is that the public needs to be shown uh, that there are no good solutions. So at the moment, I think a lot of people think that it is within the gift of the Fed to simply keep on pushing up interest rates until such a time um, as, as the problem is contained. But they're not going to like it because things are going to break along the way. And actually, it's not going to help. Uh, let, me, let me explain further what I mean by things, uh, things are going to break. So another thing that's different about the 1970s to now is that in the 1970s, that inflation was primarily, it was um, the private creation of money. Because actually, most of the money that's created is done through private banks. When a loan is, is, is given, that effectively creates money. And you sort of get that fractional reserve you know, spiral effect that, you know, more money creates more money, creates more money. And effectively, what you're doing with interest rates is that you're making the price of debt, so the price of creating new money, higher. So therefore, fewer people wish to do that. So fewer people take out loans, less new money is created, and inflation comes down. That is not what has happened here. It was not private banks creating additional money at the beginning of the lockdown that created this inflation spurge. It was the quantitative easing. It was the government doing it. So the inflation that we're experiencing now is not going to be um, tampered down by increasing the, the cost of private money creation, because it's not something that's happening now. It is the follow on effect from what happened 18 months ago. It's in the past. You could send um, interest rates to whatever number you like, you're not going to undo what happened 18 months, two years ago. The only thing the Fed can do is they can crush the other half of the equation. So the other half of the equation is what's on the demand side. So they can force a recession. And if people don't have jobs, if businesses aren't alive, they can't spend any money, therefore they can't contribute to inflation. But it's 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 the wrong way of doing things. You're not you're not actually helping the problem. You're just making it look like you are when you consider a single metric, the CPI, by crushing people, by putting people out of jobs and destroying businesses. Now that hasn't happened yet. Um, actually, employment numbers in the US are, are still reasonably strong. They're still actually quite strong in the UK as well. But the wash on effect of what is happening at the moment is, I think that is going to turn. Um, I think. I think the US has um, uh, job figures out today. Is that right? I, I may have got that wrong, but I think you've got. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, you've got. I think have you got some. We'll some, some job, end, yeah, you've got some. You've got some figures coming out soon. Okay. Um, and, and I think that I think it's going to turn. And at that point, um, the politicians are going to step in because the politicians were concerned. Um, I mean, a lot of a lot of the behaviour we're seeing at the moment is is basically to get to the other side of the midterms. Mm -hmm. So the politicians were concerned that the inflation was going to be a big problem for them. Um, but soon people are going to start screaming about the fact that they're losing their jobs, that their businesses are uh, closing down and that their mortgage rates are skyrocketing. That's going to become a bigger problem. And then the politicians are going to step in and say to the central bankers, actually, I know we told you to worry about inflation. Now, now start worrying about this other thing. And the, and the narrative will shift from inflation to growth. Um, and you'll know we're on the verge of that because the regime friendly media sources um, will quite evidently change their tune. Um, people will start saying, you know, in, in, inflation is beat, but 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 growth is the problem. Um, and that's when you know that the US public are being prepared for that pivot, and then it will come. I think we're very close to that point. Unless Powell, you know, summons the spirit of Volcker, right, and, and actually tries to... Well, I mean, he's, he's trying to do that at the moment. Um, but, it's, it's, but the U.S. economy will break if he, if he keeps pushing. 
Um, and then the politicians are going to want to step in because, I mean, people are going to start screaming about their mortgages soon. People are going to start screaming about, um, you know, the effect on their businesses and their jobs. And, and um, you know, and, and, and then he then he, they will be forced to change. Now, whether that happens before or after the midterms basically depends on how much pain um, manifests um, in the short term. But that pain is coming. And really, obviously, the, the market is driving this as well, right? And all those that have the incentive to want the market to go higher, that, you know, not so much... They, they, they want their number to go up, right? They they want to see their asset values start to rise again. Uh, so they're, they're quick to jump on that narrative of we need to save the economy uh, because they, they want the Fed to pivot and so they can start to see the stock market go up. Right? Yeah, a, I mean... A lot of pressure coming from, from the market, those that want to see the, you know, the market start to, to bounce and go back up. Right. Yeah, I mean, certainly, certainly if, if there is a pivot uh, and and actually the pivot doesn't have to be full on quantitative easing. A pivot could be as little as slowing down on the um, uh, on the quantitative tightening. It could just be slowing it down or it could or it could be stopping that and just maintaining a neutral position. It could be, uh, you know, stopping the interest rate rises that they are. You know, I think they're talking about something like another 120 base, 125 basis points, you know, may, maybe scaling back on that. So a pivot doesn't have to be a full pivot into into full bone money printing. I think that will come in time. Um, but the people calling for it. Um, I, I kind of want to nuance that a bit because you I mean you could say that I'm calling for it, um, and and yes, I am um, um, long um, U.S. Um, stocks at the moment because I think it's going to be coming. I'm not calling for it because I think that it is desirable. It's just I think that that's the economic realities of what is going to be forced to happen. Right, um, and you know, got kids to feed. So you know, I, I, even though I think that what is going on is 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 frankly awful you know why, why not take advantage of it if it's, if it's, if it's going to happen anyway um you know we we, we got to keep up with this inflation uh somehow and um you know be, being long risk assets i think i think it's probably going to be one of the mechanisms to do that it is deeply sad um you know pe people out people like me should be out there um doing something uh, you know economically productive i don't know i should be a carpenter making chairs or something you know something something useful that people can People can sit on you. Know, there are so many useful things that should be happening, uh, and actually, at the late stages of a uh, of a currency collapse, it, it is simply easier and more profitable um, to um, to try and second guess what what twelve elders in a room um, in the Atlanta Fed are going to do, and then you know make your bets according to that. It shouldn't be that way, but it is that way. So, I mean, yeah, you could say I'm I'm, I'm calling for it, but. I, I don't like it. I just, I just think that is the reality. Right. You're, you're, you're just following your, your natural incentives, like, like everybody else, uh, which is yeah part of the reason why we're in this problem, uh, because people are people, and we have a system that's leading us in, in this direction. Mm. Um, now well, we're, we're massively in fed, we're, we're mass, massively financialized. So um, you know, there, there's something like you know one and a half million people in the UK who, who work in financial services. Uh, I don't know what it, in the, it is in the US, but it will be a very large number, whatever it is. Financial services should essentially be providing a little bit of functionality around some long term savings um, and funding to small businesses. It's not, you know, our, our both of our economies are so massively over and financialized. Um, and you've got all of this brain power that could be going off and doing useful things, you know, inventing stuff, working on um, manufacturing, um, technological advance. Instead, you've got all of this brain power and all of this capital tied up in this massively over financialized system. Um, but that is that is what you get with a, um, a fiat money system, especially one in the late stages like this. It pulls resources away from from where it should be. Now, we're going to have to go through a crisis. People are going to have to understand that the money system that we have is, is frankly incompatible with the type of the economy that we, we have. I could go on to explain that if you like. There's a bit of a thesis on that. I do probably need you know uh, four or five minutes to, to get into that. Um, but we are going to need to move over to a um, non-expansionary money system. Um, you know, Something like Bitcoin could be it, at a minimum, a return to something like gold. Um, and unfortunately, I think people are just going to have to put up with a very rough 2020s while this understanding permeates. 
and it becomes increasingly obvious to everybody uh, that the current system cannot serve their needs. Right, and, and like you said, and we, we could get into that. I like I think that's naturally, you know, we're, we're continuing to head down that road. Um, like you said, the, you know, the inflation problem isn't being solved, this, but despite the efforts that are being made, so things ultimately are, are still getting getting worse. Well, they're, uh, but they're not addressing the supply side. So, right. so no, nothing the Fed is doing is increasing the amount of energy available. Um, nothing is increasing, um, you know, the productive output of the US or any other Western economy. Um, it's it's not producing more commodities. The Fed cannot do any of those things. The only thing it can do is hit the other side of the equation, the demand side. So mm -hmm. all it's all it's doing is 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 crushing demand. Which, and when I say crushing demand, what I mean is is is, is crushing um, uh, US wage earners and, and businesses and to a certain extent at the moment what it's doing is, is it's exporting that pain but so it can only do that for so long and I, I guess what i'm trying to get at is there's only so many times this trick can be played you know this cycle could happen like we said we, we somehow made it through the 70s but things were different and you, you laid out why that was different um but ultimately, do we, do we get to the point where the jig is up in terms of dealing with the reaction from the populace uh, where, you know, because the third option seems like the most likely option, right? It's the thing, the way we've always been doing things, the way we'll continue to do things. Uh, it's the way polit the, everybody's incentives are towards that option. And like you said, the middle class gets crushed. Uh, those that don't own assets get crushed, but do those people eventually get fed up to the point where they, you know, revolt, where they no longer uh, allow this system to uh, hold them down? I mean, do we is that the the fi one of one of the potential final outcomes when when you talk about you know the the nearing end of this system? Is that potentially what's going to happen? Yeah, I think that's the inevitable outcome, but it's it. It will take longer than you think, um, or I could be wrong because you know I, I so my central thesis is that the 2020s are going to be a very rough period, and it is going to demonstrate to people that this um, uh, paper money system is on its last legs and it's not serving the interests of people. And I think it's going to take the best part of this decade to get that message across. So I'm not expecting change anytime soon. However, um, you know. The Bank of England almost blew up yesterday, um, and you're going to see more and more of those events happening. And every time one of these things happen, the financial authorities have to respond to it in the correct way. Otherwise, that is the day that it all comes down. Now, they're quite good at doing this, and they've got lots of tools at their disposal. Unfortunately, we're at the point now where basically all of those tools results in um, the rich getting richer and the poor getting crushed under it because because it does come down to that money printing. You know, this system um, should have ended a long time ago. The way I look at it is, you know, perhaps, you know, the, the Asian crisis in, in 1998, that was probably the last time that this, this whole problem could have been dealt with honestly. Um, you know, the world could have um, basically restructured its debt then. Um, and had a prolonged recession and then come out clean on the other side. Maybe it could have done that after the dot-com crash in 2001. But by the time you get to 2008, the problem keeps getting bigger and bigger because every time you go through one of these, the response is, okay, let's not have, an in let's not have a recession. Let's just basically create more money, create more debt um, so that this particular administration or government doesn't have to look bad. Um, we push the problem on to the next one. And so actually, I feel slightly, well, no, I don't, I don't feel bad because I, I don't care, but I feel slightly bad for the current UK government because, you know, we, we've got a new prime minister, um, you know, she comes in, she shakes hands with the Queen, the Queen immediately dies, and then she gets her hands on uh, on the Treasury, and the Treasury immediately dies. Um, I'm not really sympathetic because the new government would have done all of the bad things that all of the previous governments have done. Um, but, you know, th these are accumulation, uh, accumulation of problems that have built up over time. So what I think will happen is uh, over this next 10 years, it will become increasingly obvious. And then um, and then we come to a pivot point. And the pivot point could go um, one of two ways. 
if the people who are currently wealthy and powerful now get their way, we will transition onto probably something like a central bank digital currency, which is basically digital slavery for you know the next God knows how many generations in, until we can throw it off. But once you have a central bank digital currency, it's, it's very difficult to see um, how you would even fight back against your government at that point because they, they can see every transaction that you make um, and if they see you, um, you know, it will be tied to a digital ID as well. Um, it will then become a requirement that everything you do online is linked to your digital ID. So if you start appearing on podcasts where you criticize the regime, it's going to be very easy for them um, to, to basically turn off your money and say, you know, you are, you are not welcome in society. You can't buy, uh, you can't travel around the country. Now, th this would have been considered um, sort of doom porn even a couple of years ago, but the Canadian government has just done this. Uh, the, the Chinese government does it all the time. So it, it is a well-established mechanism, and it's now taking place in Western countries, in the Anglosphere. Why wouldn't that happen in the US or the UK? So I think they will. So that's one pivot point. In the future, that when the technology is ready, we go down the central bank digital currency route. The only other viable option, um, I think, is probably going to be something like Bitcoin which would be removing um, the state from money. Um, and when you do that, I mean, it, it doesn't instantly solve all of your problems, but it solves all the ones where um, central planning of money um, is, the, is the predominant factor. And most of what we're seeing at the moment is, is all about that. It is all state intervention into money um, because central planning doesn't work. Um, money is half of, of every transaction that takes place. Um, and money is being centrally planned. Therefore, um, basically everything is being perverted by this um, central planning. You know, basically late stage capitalism under paper money starts to become indistinguishable from communism. And that's going to become increasingly clear to people, I think, over the next 10 years. But people have to start to realise um, how negative it is. And it is only, I mean, that's what that's why I do podcasts like this all the time. Is because we have to get the message out to people to understand what the problem is. Um, it's, you know, I'm, I'm not saying Putin's a nice guy or anything, um, but you know, when Western governments try and blame it all on him, that's that's not true. It's down to the decisions we've made over the last forty years and, and this debt that we've accumulated. That's why we're in this mess. Do you love coffee and Monero as much as we do? Consider making gratuitous.org your daily cup. Pay with Monero for premium fresh beans. And if you like what you taste, send a digital cash tip directly to the Guatemalan farmers that made it possible. Proceeds help us grow this channel, gratuitous, and Monero. And just to go back to the CBDs and the digital identities, uh, uh, th th like you said, they're, they're not conspiratorial; that they're happening, right? They're they're happening. Governments around the world are actively working on these technologies. Uh, some of them have already yeah. been, you know, test nets have already been created, implemented. Um, are you saying that central banks essentially are creating these technologies as a way to? Uh, control people because of this fear that the jig is up with what what's going on with the current financial system that they need essentially more control over the people over the general population so that they can dampen people down and, and essentially prevent them from from revolting is that kind of part of what your thesis is yeah, I mean, it kind of gets to that. I mean, you, you never need to um, give governments any particular excuse to want more control and to want more power. You know, if, if they're offered it, it will take it. But yes, there is there is evidently a drive to push these things in. So the technology for central bank digital currency isn't ready yet. But the but the sister component, which is um, digital IDs, that most certainly is um, top of the agenda currently. So I think it was um, twenty. 2017 or maybe 2018, when the um, the World Economic Forum event at Davos, um, the headline theme was um, digital IDs. They produced a policy paper um, which essentially gave governments homework. And that homework was go back and start working on plans for digital IDs in, in your own country. Um, 
I don't know what, what happened in the US. I'd imagine uh, that somebody somewhere is working on it. I do know that in, in the UK, that shortly after that World Economic Forum paper came out, um, a UK government paper then came out um, basically saying next steps on digital IDs. And if, if you compare the two documents, it is, it is quite obvious that UK government was, was given its orders um, and it is working on it. And, and I know that a whole bunch of different comp uh, countries are. Once you've got that digital ID, um, you give it a few years and the technology will be established for central bank digital currencies. I don't think central banks are going to develop the technology themselves. They will probably pick one of the um, probably one of the layer ones out there uh, and then co-opt it into being um, their, their central bank digital currencies. But certainly I, I know, for example, the Bank of England has got a department working on it. I would be amazed if if the if the US Treasury didn't have you know departments working on it, whether they publicly admit that or not. I just I just know that the in the UK they have publicly admitted that they have got teams working on it. Um because they are going to need an alternative to when this paper money system fails. Um, you know, we've talked about inflation. One of the downsides of trying to get out of this this debt problem with all of this inflation is that the way you create the money, as we talked about, makes the rich richer. So even uh, even with the best of intentions, something like a CBC a CBDC does give you tools because if everybody was on that, instead of creating the money at the nexus between government and finance, they could say to everybody, "Okay, well we're going to give you um, a universal income." So everybody in the US, you know, three hundred dollars paid into their account, or, or or maybe means tested, or you know, certain demographics or whatever, you get three hundred dollars paid into your your account every year. And on the face of it, that looks great. You can see a lot of the politicians going for something like that. And, you know, especially especially more on the left, you know, handouts direct to the people. Yeah, why not go for it? And the people, are, of course, the people are not going to say no to that. But what it also gives them is a massive tool set to monitor, control everything that you do. So people will want to sign up for it, but what they probably won't realise when that happens is that they are basically sacrificing freedom. So things that you can do with central bank digital currencies, um, you can say, OK, well, um, green agenda, you can only um, put so much fuel in your car. If you go beyond that, you're destroying um, the environment. So we will lock out um, any um, gas purchases beyond a certain point. We can say that you can only fly abroad um, one time a year um, for, for environmental reasons or for any other agenda. So you know, politics in the US um, is quite amusing to watch from my point of view as an outsider. Um, but there are so many combative narratives going around. You can see a tool like that being used all over the place for you must do that, but you mustn't do that. And actually, it could get to the point down the line where uh, in order to stimulate the economy, they can say something like, OK, your wages are going to be paid in on Monday morning and, and your money has an expiration date. Uh, on midnight on Sunday, so go out there and spend. Um, they can they can tax um, certain demographics um, higher than than other demographics, you know. And and this is basically just going to lead to to so much more divisiveness. Um, but it's also it's also going to take away people's ability to resist government because if they if they can shut you down at the money level, you, you don't have a lot of good options left. So yeah, the, that's the bad outcome, uh, and the good outcome is is like I say, an, uh, you know, a, a money which is independent of state. Yeah, and, and anybody who's thinking, well, you know, it's it's too far fetched for for everybody to just jump on this boat. I mean, just look at you know what we just went through with COVID, right? Uh, you know, yeah. the, the sheep, uh, the the sheeple are are strong. The power of the sheeple are strong. You know, there are people like you and I and most of the people that listen to this show that are that are questioning these things. But the vast majority of people just go along, go along with whatever the, the government is, you know. Public. Yeah, it's, it's extraordinary. So I, I had always assumed um, that, that people were a little bit more um, self-aware, um, able to, you know, reason from first principles. COVID clearly demonstrated that you basically just need to shine an, a narrative on onto the telly and people will accept it unquestioningly i mean I, I, at, the, at the height of the covid thing here in the uk i used to joke that if if um if boris johnson came out on the news with his two two advisors either side and said that everybody from now on has to dress like big bird to go to the shops people would start doing it you know whatever the tv said is, is what people did um and it's actually been quite remarkable it was covid 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 
all of a sudden that became unviable and then suddenly we pivoted to ukraine covid was forgotten overnight and now it's ukraine 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 and that's why i'm confident that there there will be a pivot coming soon um and and the pivot is going to be um to growth uh because i think i think the 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 us economy is is going to break at some point if if they continue down this road uh narrative pivots to to growth and then you're back to quantitative easing because that is the only thing that mathematically makes sense with with this much debt level um you know and and if someone wants to make an argument as to how you can get out of this current situation with these debt levels well tell me how but as far as i can see there is there's no um, mathematically coherent way of doing that at this point it has to be that how how nefarious do you think these things actually are is there some you know cabal behind all of this you know the one world government thing is there are there a group of evil people saying all right uh let's let's uh you know t tame the populace with with covid let's let's see if we can you know let's see how how easy it is to control the sheep all right pretty easy now let's implement the central bank digital currency you know because some people lay it out that way is 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 is, is there some plotting that's happening is this conspiratorial is there conspiracies or is it just um you know the natural tendencies of of the system of governments yeah so a lot of people misunderstand the great reset so the great so i i hear a lot of people saying that the great reset is a plan to crash global economies to seize control it is not that it is a recognition that global economies are going to collapse anyway, or at least the fiat money system is going to collapse anyway. What the Great Reset actually is, is a set of policy proposals to put controls in place so that when that collapse happens, the same people who are wealthy and powerful now get to remain wealthy and powerful on the other side of that collapse. And that's why it is so heavy on mechanisms such as digital IDs, um and cbdc's you know all like i said the, the digital ids was was a main theme of, of the davos event a couple of years ago and they are increasingly putting out policy papers now on central bank digital currencies in terms of whether it is evil people yes is it nefarious not exactly so the people who are the the current crop of global elites they are there by definition because the system that we have um has resulted in them getting to Basically, they, they floated to the top. They feel it is their duty to preserve this system because they are unable to consider possibilities outside of this system. So I think in their own minds, they genuinely believe that they're the good guys. And that they are doing the things that are necessary in order to preserve the system and make it work. And it just so happens that the things that they need to do in order to preserve this current system is exactly the thing that has resulted in them being so wealthy and powerful. So it is a very easy sell for them to believe um, that it must be preserved because it benefits them hugely. But they they also but they think it's their job. You know they, they think to themselves, well, it, well, you know, who else is going to do this apart from us? And actually, I can make a very coherent case for a lot of this stuff being done for the best intentions. So if you are a politician, you know, around the world. Um, do you want effectively my option two, which is we let this system crash um, and we hard reset? Now, you could simply say to those politicians, well, if you do that, you're basically wiping out people's pensions. You're wiping out the ability of the government to provide services to people to operate effectively. It is very easy to see that um, as all negative. Taking the longer term perspective, we know that this system that we currently have is detrimental to our benefit and it is driving wealth and power to an ever smaller elite and that we know we need to emerge onto something on the other side. But what those options are and what does emerge on the side, that's kind of not clear yet. I, I could come up with some vague ideas as to what it might look like, but effectively you need to go through this, this crisis period, this transition where something fails and something else emerges on the other side. Uh, and I am inclined to believe that that is that is something like Bitcoin. That's what you th you think the other side will will look like something something like that. I think that would be a solution. It's not necessarily where we're going to end up. Um, 
maybe it's 60 40 whether we go down the freedom route or the or, or the full um, digital communism route i know that the people in charge at the moment are going to be very keen to go down the full digital communism uh, which of the two we end up with i i don't know um but but effectively it has has to be one of those uh, and obviously i'm rooting for the for the good option um but you know brace that it could go the other way as well now you said something interesting when you were talking about cbdc's you said they might just end up co-opting one of the current layer ones mm. that's something we talk about a lot on, on this show you know there, there's fear that something like bitcoin is more prone to being co-opted compared to something like monero right so given given the fact that bitcoin is uh has this transparent uh, you know, ledger. It, it essentially has an attack surface that that governments can use to, uh, you know, mm. fang it, co-opt it, right? So it still exists, but it would essentially be controlled if you know governments can very easily and perfectly surveil everyone's transactions, and maybe even in the worst case scenarios, uh, mm. take over mining because of you know the the current trend towards large mining industries that would then have to follow regulations that governments put in place so creating you know OFAC compliant miners do you have any thoughts concerns there that something you know that bitcoin could be essentially the the cbdc of of the future and not necessarily the thing that saves us all from the cbdc yeah so I'm, I'm i'm no i'm i'm pretty relaxed about bitcoin um i mean yes it is something that they can surveil but i don't think they're going to be able to get control of it i mean that that ship has sailed i mean maybe they've done it you know a long time ago but you know, it was not in their interest to do it so I, i'm i'm a lot less concerned about that um what i will say though is that um i am grateful that something like monero exists it was not something that i really considered um until that um the, the trucker protests in canada because you know obviously people use the uh, tradfi system to get um money to the truckers and then people started having their bank accounts closed down and extremely punitive action was put upon them so they then turned to to bitcoin to get around that but as you correctly say um the well, the, the, the chain is exposed you can see what you can do and it is not difficult to imagine that governments will um, start investigating that more thoroughly. And it was at that point that I thought, okay, I need a privacy um, option as well. So I, 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 don't, I don't actively use Monero, but what I, what I did do is I went and made sure I understood it. So I opened up a wallet. Um, I bought myself a little bit of Monero. Um, I, I haven't had cause to use it a lot at the moment, but it is, it is very gratifying to know um, that in the future, should I want something that um, to stay out of the, the sight of government, um, then, then that is something I can turn to. So I'm very grateful to have that option there. Now, in terms of what they're going to use for the central bank digital currencies, they I, I think they will co-op one of the, one of the layer ones, and it will probably I don't know Cardano, Solana, some, something like that. They 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 will will go to them and say, you know, can you build us out uh, this? Because governments are not techies. You know, everything everything techie they touch blows up in their face. So. Yeah, it, it, they they will seek a partner for it. And then, so how uh, decentralized or unaffected by governments do you think Bitcoin will will stay? I mean, uh, uh, why, why why do you have this belief? You go into it a little bit more. I mean, because I'm a skeptic of it, right? Obviously, uh, you know, I, I you know I, I don't like to. I'm not. I don't want to be come across as a fear monger or you know a concern troll. But, uh, you know, I think we kind of, everything we're talking about, right? Governments have the, whether it's, it's deeply nefarious, but that the system mm -hmm. is built towards always trying to uh, gain control, right? And they see something as Bitcoin as ultimately being a threat. We're talking mm -hmm. potentially being the solution. Uh, but how, how does government, I mean, how does Bitcoin not get co-opted? By, by governments given you know it's it's architecture well i mean it, it basically it's, it's too diffuse at this point there's, there's too much varied mining taking place in, in too many places and, and yes it is it is certainly not beyond the wit of the u.s government to establish large-scale uh, mining farms and seize a large portion of control uh, that is something that it is in their remit to do um but you know 
any government, uh, you know, especially the US government, is not in the business of having partial control. That That is not to the model they operate on. They want 100% control. So I, I think the incentive structure for them is far more likely to be something along the lines of um, co-opting one of the layer ones and, and building out a central bank digital currency that they control absolutely. So let's go into so what what do you, how do you see it playing out then? So obviously CBDCs uh, we're, we're going down that path. They're going to be implemented. That something they control absolutely. At the same time, we have Bitcoin and Monero gaining grassroots adoption. Uh, you see those things. Obviously, you see Bitcoin as potentially saving us in some ways but what will then be the dynamic what will the world look like i mean are we going to have you know the cbdc world where you know 80 percent of the population is using that and then just kind of a, a dark corner of the world that's using crypto or is it going to be integrated into everybody's life and people will be using cbdc's to interface with the government but using crypto in their personal lives yeah, pretty much that. So the best good outcome that I can see that is also vaguely realistic, given um, given the way that governments are, is that we go through this period that I talked about, the 2020s, I think are going to be a difficult period, a high inflationary period. Um, I think Bitcoin adoption will continue to accelerate. So I think we're, we're roughly at the point now where the internet was in 1997. It has about 300 million um, users around the globe the same as the internet did in 1997. The only difference is that the um, the crypto sphere is growing twice as fast as the internet was. And the internet was the um, fastest adoption rate of any technology ever until that point. And, and now Bitcoin and, and, and other blockchains, they're growing at twice that rate. So, you know, it's not going to be that much longer before we hit a billion people and then two billion and so on. So what I think will happen over the next 10 years is that... Um, uh, crypto will grow, specifically the user interface that allows people to interact with it far more easily. So again, I use the analogy of you know, back in 1997, if you wanted to use the internet, it was, I mean, it's hard work. You had that, you, do you remember those dial-up modems with the yeah, pins yeah. and the words and the clicks? Yeah. And, 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 and Yeah, and, it, and ju just getting onto a web page was hard work. Um, but now, you know, you, you pull something out your pocket and it's, it's just, it's all there and accessible. So that layer will develop as well. So so the best case scenario I can I can see is that adoption for crypto um, smoothly grows along with the user interface level over the next 10 years. Um, as the paper money systems increasingly crumble and effectively the sort of two pass each other by, um, and it is possible to step off from one failing system on the way down. You're not going to save everybody when you do that because some people are going to never make the adoption. Um, but increasingly more and more people will be on the other thing. So you can allow the old system to fail without it being a complete wipeout because that's the problem that we have right here, right now. So we have had um, uh, countries and currencies fail. I mean, it happens to Argentina all the time. But when it happens in Argentina, everybody just goes to their top drawer and pulls out the US dollars that they've got waiting there because every time it blows up, they just go over to that. So we've had plenty of countries and currencies fall over, but they've been an island of chaos within a, basically a, a sea of stability. And this time it's going to get flipped because if the US dollar fails, that's 80% of global transactions. So now all of a sudden it's going to be small islands of stability in an absolute sea of chaos. So we need those adoption levels to, to grow across. So, you know, what would be a potential good outcome um, for 2035, for example? I don't think you're going to be able to get governments to um, let go of their desire of control. So I see something like a central bank digital currency um, that you use for interacting with your government, for paying taxes, um, and, and for other things like that. Um, but you also have the option of using other chains, um, especially for international transactions, for saving, um, for, for exchanges between people. If we do go down the central bank digital currency routes, I hope that people like us can warn people of the dangers so that sufficient safeguards are put in place. So in the US, 
this is probably unrealistic at this point, but if there were to be a constitutional amendment saying that um, the new central bank digital currency was not programmable, so it couldn't be used as a tool of government to discriminate you know, against one group of people against another or to shut down purchases, that people basically had the freedom to spend their money as the way they wanted. That's all part of the, of, of the good set of solutions. Um, and the future in, in 2035 would be, you know, your your regional um, central bank digital currency, so the the, the dollar or the pound, um, the um, Bitcoin or whatever other chains are um, strong and viable at, at that future point, um, and then other reserve currencies around the world, so the BRICS currency and perhaps you know one or two others. That's that's I think about as good as it gets. All right. Do you think do you think there's any scenario where governments in an attempt to to compete with these other technologies actually end up uh you know just full on adopting them uh, you know not even trying to adem- adopt a CBDC um but yeah. you know maybe adopt a, a true crypto or like you said create a CBDC that really ends up being something more like a a, a true crypto do you think that's possible or governments will, will- would never let that power go, even if it means that they, they ha- if they're forced to negotiate because of these. So it, it would have to be something that. So yes, there is a scenario where you can get to that point, um, but it would have to be um, Western governments completely losing control before their alternative option is ready. So um, you know, let's say in a couple of years' time, um, adoption of crypto has continued. And I don't know, let's say, for example, 70% of US citizens hold crypto at that point and are familiar with it. And the user interface level has developed to the point where it is viable to do payments. But government is lagging um, and their central bank digital currency plans simply are not viable at that point. They cannot get them to work and they lose control um, of, the, of, well, not just the treasury, the, the whole thing, the whole paper money system collapses prematurely. Um, which would have been considered a completely fanciful idea two years ago, but it is increasingly looking like it is a matter of when, not if. Now, at that point, um, they have to go over to something else. They've lost all of their credibility, so it's very difficult to bring in a new paper money system to replace it. Um, And the only other viable alternative at that point is, say, the BRICS currency, which is up and running, or, or or the Chinese yuan. Now, would the U.S. government rather have Bitcoin or the Chinese yuan being the um, the global reserve, given that it doesn't it can't push its own? It will it will in that case prefer Bitcoin over the yuan. But that's a very that, 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 I mean that's quite a quite a narrow path because basically you 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 need you need crypto to be sufficiently ready. Um, for 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 central bank digital technology not to be ready yet and you need a wholesale collapse um of of um you know the western financial system um at the same time as the strength in in say the chinese system you need all of those sort of things to to those ducks to align it could happen it's just not my base case i i think that's less likely than more but yes there is a path to that how about like a you know a a, a strong um you know, uh, backlash by the government. So, you know, they're, they're back up against the wall. They, they see where things are headed. They don't want to lose this power. So they, they try to like outright ban, ban crypto. Um, do you, mm. do you see that potentially happening? Uh, is that, you know, or maybe in some countries, not another. Yeah. I, th- I think that is, a, that is probably a risk that is receding. Um, you know that their, their, their time to do that would have been sort of five or six years ago. I mean, you've now got um, you now got Fidelity offering it to their clients. You've got um, you know hedge fund managers all over the place. Um, you know buying into it. You know wealthy individuals are um, investing into it, um, and you know basically law is politicians are downstream of money. So when the big money has moved into this and are finding it useful. Uh, I, I think their chance for, for banning it has 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 basically diminished. Um, they they can try and regulate it. They can try and seize as much control as as they can. They are probably unlikely to get too draconian though, because they want to see where this is going, um, and they want to see if they can use it. Um, and also, it's 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 quite a good plan B, 
because actually most of the Bitcoin mining is now in the US. So if you were to get an utter collapse of, of the Western financial system, which is not my base case, I, th I think that I think I think the Western financial system is going to uh, increasingly lose power over the next 10 years. But it's not impossible that there could be a disorderly collapse. I mean, we we didn't come that far off it in 2008. Um, that could happen again. So it's, it's quite nice to have that that back option, that backup uh, option open to them. And how about Monero? Do you do you have do you think they might, you know, you know, Bitcoin's okay, but we're going to go after Monero because it's, you know, uh, it's used to whatever, it's used for nefarious things. Do you think that, that, that could happen? I mean, we see a little bit of that already, right? With the listings on exchanges. Yeah, um, what was it, Tornado Coin that went after? Yeah, the Treasury yeah. Department sanctioned Tornado Cash. Um, yeah. Yeah, my, my understanding of, I mean, you, you can tell me, but my understanding of Monero is that it is it is truly decentralized. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, yeah, good luck. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what we say here all the time. Just, I'm just curious. Uh, yeah. yeah. And if, I mean, if, if I, I, I th maybe if they could, they would. But, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's a bit like stopping, um, you know, file sharing. Right. You know, how, how did that go? I mean, all they could do is basically pick the occasional, you know, teenager um, and, and come down on them like a ton of bricks and throw them in jail for, for sharing music files. But you couldn't, you couldn't shut the network down. You could only pick out individuals and, and, and come down on them hard. I, I, I don't, how, how else would you shut Monero down? I, I, I don't know how they would do it. Yeah, I mean, effectively, they can't. They could, mm. you know, make laws, make rules, uh, but then, you know, effectively, you know, what those laws and rules would actually be able to accomplish, I, you know, I don't know. Mm um so let me put it to me do, do you advance the store of value um uh, idea for monero or, or is it is it more of a transactional vehicle for you no i see it as having you know the the, the same essential value proposition of of bitcoin right so mm. uh i see it i see it as money um mm. i see it as being useful today from day one as as digital cash where you can transact with it but ultimately, I see it as being a store of value, uh, just like it's the same premise for Bitcoin, right? Or what Bitcoin's premise was. Hmm. Obviously, you know, the network effect as uh, Metcalf's law, right? And, you know, as more people use hmm. this network, uh, the value is, is going to have to go up. Um, hmm. So from that, it will, it will be a store of value. And I mean, it has effectively been over hmm. time. Right, you know, it started at zero, like Bitcoin, and now it's it's obviously above zero. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the uh, the idea being as as more people use it for transactions, it works as for transactions today. Very very low transaction fees, uh, private by default. There's no hopping through hoops to make it private, so it's it's fu it's fungible. Every transaction is equal to every other transaction in terms of of how it's it's viewed on the ledger. So perfectly fungible. And then over time, it will it will gain value as as more people use the system and de and demand you know the limited supply of Monero for their for their mm. own purposes. Yeah, I mean, I think that's perfectly fair. I mean, I I, I haven't focused on it much. I, I'm I've, I've been well, I'm not a Bitcoin maxi, but I'm you know, I'm sort of eighty percent of the way there. Um, but you know, I, I I like Monero. I mean, it is it is decentralized. Um, it, it has that thing that Bitcoin doesn't have in, in that it's got that, um, uh, that that privacy sort of element on it as well. Um, yeah, why not? I mean, per perfect, perfectly viable chain, good use case, decentralized. You know, what, what's not what's not like basically? Yeah, perfectly decent. Yeah, yeah, very, very similar to, to Bitcoin in many ways. You know, same, same, mm. same basic concept. Uh, the, the the major fundamental difference is the. The, the blockchain is obfuscated. The, the you know the ledger is obfuscated, so you you can't see who's sending what to who, what the amounts are, what the uh, receive address is, and and who's sending. So um, it has low adoption. So if you're valuing things on the basis of Metcalf law, as you talked about, then then uh, yes, it is. Well, it's a long way behind Bitcoin in that. Uh, it doesn't have the same level of, of cryptographic security because there is less compute power going into it. I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, block rewards still on Monero, I would have, I would have thought. Block, is, is that yeah, so Monero has, yeah, it's proof of work. R256, yeah, proof of work. Okay, yeah, yeah. Proof so uh, It's yeah. different in that it's, uh, it's ASIC resistant. 
So um, you can't you can't mine Monero with an ASIC. So this this plays into its decentralization. So all, all the design decisions behind Monero are for the purposes of making it as as unstoppable as possible in terms right. of okay. not being able to turn the network off or control it in any way. So mm. uh, unlike Bitcoin, it's not tending towards having these large mining corporate mining farms. Mm. Uh, it's you know anybody with a CPU can fairly compete to mine Monero, um, given its its proof of work. It's called RandomX. Uh, basically, okay. it makes the CPU the, the ASIC of Monero. Uh, it has a tail emission, so it's, mm. it's nominally capped at like 18.6 million. It, it recently reached that cap. Mm. And thereafter, there's a steady amount of Monero that's emitted with each new block. Uh, I see. Okay. So yeah, in, in in my you know good case for twenty thirty five, um, you know you would walk into a bar or car dealership, um, and, and you would be offered multiple different ways to pay. Um, if you want to pay your the taxes on the purchase of your new car or your beer or whatever it is, um, you have to do that element through the through the central bank digital currency. I could see that you know the the, the digital dollar, um, but the other element of it you could potentially run through Bitcoin or Monero or whatever or whichever one you wanted to use, um, and and if that's the future that we get, um, I'm going to be reasonably happy with that because then we have the advantages of um, of a crypto world, um, money largely out of the hands of um, of government. Um, I, I just concede the fact that um, you know governments are rather pernicious things. It's difficult to get rid of them, uh, and I think they're going to you know they're, they're going to have their hooks in. Maybe as maybe humanity will evolve past that, but maybe not in my lifetime. So you know, I'm I'm, I'm tempering my optimism somewhat. Yeah, yeah, same here. I mean, uh, you know, I'm just I'm just taking action. That's why you know I do this show. That's why I'm. You know, all Monero, and I, I try to get others to use Monero. I think that our best shot, I think, is just trying to grow adoption of crypto itself and get people actually using it, uh, so we could achieve these outcomes that you're talking about, right? Where we we shift over to a crypto world, and the the only way that happens is if people start actually adopting it and using it beyond speculation, right? So, yes, you, you made the point that that that. Uh, you know, maybe it seems like Monero pales in comparison to Bitcoin uh, in, in terms of its network, uh, but it's actually quite robust in terms of real world, real usage. So Monero mm. uh, has become the, the, the crypto of choice uh, on the dark markets. You know, uh, ra you know, ransomware hackers they they offer you know a twenty percent discount if that's paid in Monero. Just as an example of. <laughs> People are actually using it beyond speculation. They see a use case for it, and it's growing in adoption as an actual, you know, cash-like tool. Well, with the way governments are going, it doesn't even need to be that. It, it might even be that you want to donate to something that Justin Trudeau doesn't particularly care for. You know, sure. that, 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 that's, a, that's a perfectly viable use case for something like Monero. I mean, that, that's essentially why I got it. I mean, I don't live in Canada, but... Um, you know, if, if it can happen in one English speaking country, it can happen in another. So, you know, I, I can certainly see the reason why people would want to, uh, yeah, want, want to get on board. And and, and at minimum, um, you know, well, I started my journey on, on Bitcoin like this. I bought a little bit because I just wanted to understand it. I've done that now with Monero. I bought a little bit because I just want to understand it. Um, and, and the value proposition, I think, as you laid out, is perfectly clear. So there's there's no reason why I, I, I shouldn't potentially, you know, go deeper down that particular rabbit hole and, and go further with Monero. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Hope, hope to see you comment on it more. Dan, thank you. Thank you so much for doing this. Uh, no, I really enjoyed it. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Ho hope you get over that cold soon. Yes. Where, where can people follow you, learn more about you? Um, I'm, I'm really only active on, um, on, on Twitter. Um, my, my handle is at King Bingo underscore, which is a completely ridiculous name, but um, I, I was I was in emerging technologies uh, venture capital for years, and 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 for a long time I basically just signed up to every new app that came along. And I looked at Twitter and I thought, oh, this is stupid, that won't last, and 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 just pick some deliberately stupid name. So um, I'm stuck with it now. But yeah, at King Bingo underscore on Twitter, 
Um, I did have a go at a YouTube channel, but I'm so bad at it because um, the, the, the post editing and, and I just I couldn't get my head around it. So, uh, you know, may, maybe I'll come back to that in future. But I'll, I'll I watched your YouTube videos. Channel. They were great. Very informative. Oh, really? Oh, OK, OK. Good. Production value. But I mean, yeah, the production value was, was awful, wasn't it? But yeah. People yeah, so I, yeah my, my YouTube channel is uh, Distant Factor, but I, I strongly recommend that nobody checks it out because the videos are horrific. I, I I recommend you keep going with the uh, with the podcast, man. With the YouTube, I, th I thought they were great, actually, really fantastic. Um, yeah, the the production. Was, maybe I'll get back into it. That's the easy part, right? Well, you're doing you're you're bringing the hard part, which is actual the content and your ability mm. to express the ideas. You could get somebody else to help you clean it up if you want, but uh, uh, yeah, I should probably do that. I should probably do that. Great right. job. Great job. Yeah. Okay. Cheers, man. All right, man. Have a good day. Thanks. Cheers. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to our show on YouTube, Odyssey, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Go to MoneroTalk.live to subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.